All right, thank you, Lauren. Um, hi, everybody. I am Christina Lin. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the uh, serverless integration anatomy. So for me, a little bit about me. So I am a technical evangelist uh, in Red Hat, so I work for Red Hat. So what I typically, typically do is I create workshops, I create things that's getting started. So I believe that technology should be easy and fun to consume and should be easy for you to learn. So that's the whole goal of, of this particular session is that it gets you started on stuff. It gets you excited on the in, on the technology that we're going to talk about today. And basically, I have a Twitter. Um, so if you want to follow me on Twitter, I sometimes tweet on the stuff that I think it's interesting. Not that I'm on that all the time, but when I see something interesting or when I created something that I would put on the Twitter. And I also have a YouTube channel that takes you through the basics of how everything works, uh, especially on camel case stuff and camel. And also I have a account in D zone. So I push some of my architectural like blogs and things on top of that. So if you are interested, you can follow me. Um, but today, I am going to talk about some of my experiences when I'd want to do um, integration, especially on the server side. Well, because I'm evangelist, so I talk to a lot of people, especially for people that's interesting, uh, interested about, you know, getting the new technology, learning the new technology, trying to transform their enterprise and turn that into um, cloud enabled. This is what kind of what I see people do a lot is that when they have a very complex system, it's very hard to maintain. It's it's very very difficult to um, uh, handle and all that. They think if they move everything onto the cloud and make it serverless, all the problem will be solved, right? Well, that's not the case. Uh, well, I mean, it's it's fun like that, but I mean, if you take a look at what serverless is um, right now, because I think people think about it because of the the marketing or the people that saying that you know if you move on to serverless it's going to cost you less it's going to uh we will be able to scale by demand and that'll be a lot more optimized of resource usage and you get a near near real time latency faster time to market as a developer you only have to care, care about code and as a, a person that's paying for all the science stuff you're actually saving money right so that's the whole thing and um what it, it, it does, right? I mean, from from a person point of view, what is serverless, right? What is serverless? Well, if you think about serverless, it, the way that it makes things uh, works a lot smoother is that the system admin, they don't have to maintain a bunch of server anymore, right? You don't have to, you know, all, do a lot of operations. You don't have to uh, stand by and making sure that, you know, the entire data center full of, full of server is working for you. You don't have to set, set up this like backup data center somewhere else so that your, your stuff gets backed up and it, it gets, so when there's a disaster strikes, you can have a backup there somewhere, right? The backup strategies. As well as for developer, it should be easy for developers because developer, what they need to do when they think about serverless is that all they have to do is just start writing their code on the p on in the browser and everything will go honky dory because you know everything will just run um and then there's an architect right so the way that the architects and the people are paying for this particular um service technology is that you know uh if it, they have this uh thing where if you're not running it um, you're not paying for it. So you would have this repository of code that would spin up, spin up immediately when it's, uh, when you need to have them done together. Right. That's, that's very cool. Right. So these are the, you know, the very cool, um, wonderful service world bring. These are the benefits. If you talk to anybody that's in the service world, this is what this is what they will tell you, right? The lower operational cost because remember the, the ad system admins they don't have to take care of the servers anymore. All they have to do is just spin up everything on the cloud and all the data center, all the backups, and everything is taken care of by the vendors. And and as a and it's easy to scale because no, you no longer have to uh, buy a hundred a uh, hundred set of server because you know you know and sometimes you might need them, right? All you need to do is just purchase 
at the, the uh, number of resources that you need at the time, and then you can actually easily scale it out to how much you want at the time. So you are a lot more flexible when it comes to scaling it up and down, right? So that's really good. And from a developer side, I remember when I was a developer in IT, uh, I was working there, I hated that when my operation colleagues talked to me and asked me, how many, what do you predict? How many uh, workload, how much of a workload do you think your application is going to have? And how many CPUs do you need? And how many RAMs do you think you know, you'll need? Because I need to put that down in my paper so I can submit for a request, right? I, how am I supposed to know, right? I am a developer. I don't know how much of a prediction I can make, maybe do some cons like a very simple, uh, so very, very simple predictions. But I mean, I, I'm not a god, right? So normally what I would do is I would beef up the number of resources I need so we end up buying too much of the stuff because I don't want to get in trouble when it's not enough resources, right? And But that's cost a lot. And also, I, I there's a, another, another time when I was a developer, I have to, when, I remember when I need to push my code onto production, I need to do a packaging, I need to um, compile my code, turn it into a jar, a war, or whatever that was, and then put and, and hand it over to my colleagues, and my colleagues does the CI/CD stuff, and I need to fill in a bunch of papers, and that's a lot of complex stuff, right? And the serverless X world actually eliminate for you doing that. So all you need to do is write your code, push it into a environment, and then that's going to do that, do that for you. And because of that, it has a faster time to market. So this is all the wonderful things you will see in the serverless side, and that's why I guess a lot of people are going onto serverless because of the, of all this benefit. And um, a lot of people think that if I move on to the service world, I don't need to take care of the integrations, you know, or everything will be solved. Well, that's not the case, right? Because if you think about it, what's running underneath um, serverless, right? Uh, who is hosting that service uh, platform, right? Who, well, if you take a look at that a few years ago, there's only like a couple, a handful of vendors that's doing that. So you're basically locked into their platforms. And the sysadmin, the DevOps side people, they got into this Kubernetes world where they're doing everything in the Kubernetes where they're putting everything into containers. Um, so, uh, but then, uh, th then everything works, everything is kind of working in that way. But you've got developers that wants to do, to work on serverless and the boss now tells them that, hey, for those people that's doing Kubernetes, we want to go the serverless way because it costs less. And then we have this fight the battle between the serverless developers, uh, serverless lovers, and the container people that's um, going back and forth. I remember I saw this article on the uh, internet that they have two, uh, a person from the serverless, another person from containers, they're um, doing a rap battle between which one is better and which one is not. What, right? Like uh, as a person that's uh, doing serverless, you think containers are rigid and slow. Well, if you think about it, if you're just dealing with one single, you know, application with, and then comparing to a big chunk of container, although it's still lightweight, but you still have to compile, make it into a Docker file, an image, and then deploy it. It still seems very rigid and slow. Um, but for people that's saying that serverless, your vendor lock-in, you're, you're kind of bounded to those what, uh, one or two different vendors that provide that serverless capabilities, right? So, and what about the enterprise like security standard? Are you up to it? And, and then, all those overcomplicated stuff between the two different um, type of developers and two different type of people. That's that's not that's that's what what's been there for at least uh, two years ago or two or three years ago. So, but now um, we don't have to choose anymore, right? Um, because of this new technology that we currently have, uh, we have this whole new stack of. Um, technology that allows us to get the best of both worlds, right? So you've got Kubernetes doing the underneath the, the layout, the, the groundwork, and then you also got Knative doing the serverless for developers. And then um, in between that, you also have Kafka that's handling all the um, things happening, the flow of messages, the flow of events coming in and out uh, for the serverless load. And then you also have CamelK that does all the integration and the outward outbound and inbound uh, data transformations and data integration for you. So as a person, you kind of, when you put all these four stacks together, it gives you the, like, the total solutions of how to do serverless integration. 
And therefore, that goes into today's topics that I want to talk about, the things I want to introduce you to, maybe not go into super depth because um, I'm running a bunch of examples, but I, I would have the resource, I'll give the resource to you at the end, so you have a, a way to actually get your hands on, hands dirty with all the technology. So think about this, our SpongeBob. This is our wonderful serverless machine that does all the stuff for us. But if you take a look at how that works so smoothly, you can see that it has a backbone, a nerve system, a muscle that does most of the stuff, and then all, all this organ that uh, kind of works to everything together. So let's look at, take a look at what is Kubernetes and OpenShift. For people that doesn't know, I, I, I saw the poll, there's like a lot of people that doesn't, that's like the first time here in Apache. And if you're not familiar with this technology, let me just tell you, what that is, just to set the basics. So a Kubernetes and OpenShift is the platform that helps you to um, orchestrate your container environment. So as a developer, what you do is you write your code. You write your perfect, pretty camel code. You build it, and then you put it into a container. You, um, you do a, a Docker build, it builds the image for you. So what happens now is that when you have a bunch of these um, very uh, you have a, a bunch of developers trying to package and then running their application at the same time or on a, in the, in, in, of course, in the form of images or, or containers, you need to have a platform that manages it, right? You can't just leave it, leave everything like um, unmanaged, uncontrolled, right? So the, this platform is just for you. Like think about it as, as a, um, a platform that just, like manages all the small containers for you because think about it like uh, so when do they when do they go live when do they die when do I, when do I throw them away right so all those kind of things is taken care of by these platforms and other than that it takes care of the monitoring for you so you know like who is taking up too much resource and who is you know not there and who should I take a closer look at and, you know, things like that, you know, as an admin, you want to see what's going on. And also a place where you can store all the unused images and everything that's going to be needed later on. So you need to store all this container somewhere. It gives you a place to store it. Uh, if something goes wrong, it kind of brings everything back together. And another very um, important thing in this environment is that, you know, all this container, it contains a application that you write. But a single container that does a single thing is not really of a use in the enterprise world because you want to have everything connected and talk to each other. So they will have to have a method that they can, they know where each other's are. So you need to have a, a way to have them to be able to discover each other. So that's how the platform also do is that allows you people, allows your application to find each other. Basically that's it. And it also have configurations and loggings and you know, a bunch of stuff. So let's take a look at what it looks like, you know, um, just to show you, right? So this is the OpenShift environment or Kubernetes environment. Basically, this is just a GUI interface that shows you, hey, I've got a bunch of container running in my environment up on the cloud, right? And then I get to see, um, hey, let's take, take a look at how many container that's running here. So if you take a look at that, you see that there's a bunch of container that's running in my environment. And I, I can see that they're all running their status and how they were going. And I also get to see the, um, like, uh, how to monitor the dashboard, the metrics, and how the CPUs are doing, the traffic, how they're doing, like how, how everything. So this is just a very admin, DevOps environment for people that wants to host your serverless application. So you need this platform. This platform just handles a lot of things so you don't have to worry about it uh, later on. So that's why I say this is the, um, this is kind of like the backbone structure of the entire integration, serverless integration, right? Um, and then we go on to the, uh, oh, where am I? Way. They wait, wait, and then we go on to the operator. Um, so this operator is new. Uh, it came in like a, two, a year ago on the uh, OpenShift environment or Kubernetes environment. This pattern, people think it's difficult, but you know, think of it as an installer on your environment. Then, then it's easy, right? So basically, this is another pod, 
another running application that's installing stuff for you. So what do you need to give it to? Uh, what do you need to give to that installer so that it knows what to install, basically? So you give that, you give this operator a CR, custom resource. Basically what is what what is in this custom resource is a bunch of configurations. It's kind of like telling the operator, here's the things I wanna install in my OpenShift or Kubernetes environment, go ahead and install it. And this is how I want it. This is how I want to install three containers and each of them would have certain memories and these are some of the specs I need to have it. Things like that. Uh, so these are some kind of specs. So when the operator gets that uh, custom resource, you hear this all the time. When you hear um, people presenting today, they talk about CRs and all that. That's what it is. It's kind of a way for you to install your, your stuff. And so basically for this, you get to, so basically when you give this custom resource to the operator, the operator will then install that, uh, the things that you want to install for you and then spin up a container and then that's going to be managed inside your OpenShift environment. And uh, so there's, and then you can also not only to install, but also updates it for you, right? So if there's any problems, you want to update some of the configurations, just change the CRs and the operator notice there's a change and it's going to update it for you. Basically, that's what it is. So why is this important uh, in the service world is because you want to make as much automations as possible. You want to have the platform does most of the job for you. So the more the container does, uh, the, the platform does for you, the less you do, right? So, and then that the, the more automatic it is, the faster your, your application get can get onto that platform and then ready in production. So this is why I want to talk about it here is because once you have that platform, you need something to automate everything for you. So that's why I want to talk about it. And if you take a look at here in the, um, in the OpenShift environment, here are some of the operators that I have installed, right? So here's a bunch of stuff. And there's another thing that's called Operator Hub. Um, think of it as, as you know, your app store. So it has a bunch of apps and then you want, if, and you can pick and choose which one of the things you want to install and then you can just go ahead and install it. So basically that's it. So you have a bunch of, you know, uh, apps, you know, applications that you want to install, basically just install the operators. And in each operator, you have a place to define, let's say, MQ streams. You have a place to define your CRs. So basically the CRs is just a bunch of, um, it's, it's a basically YAML file, but it tells you how you want to configure, say in this, this time, this is a Kafka cluster. It tells you how to configure that. So Basically, that's how everything works, right? So, okay, I'm, I'm going way too slow here. I need to speed up. All right, so um, let's take a look at the uh, the K-native stuff, right? So once you have everything done, everything's cool, you're a developer, right? Uh, so how what do I need to do in a, so that my application will run on this uh, very pretty, nice managed platform? Well, I don't think it's that that simple, right? I, I don't know if you ever code a, in a uh, with Kubernetes or OpenShift before, but as a developer, you assume to you have to know all this. You need to configure all this in a YAML file, right? I don't know if you ever tried a YAML file. It's not like the perfect. It, uh, if unless you find the perfect editor, it's kind of complicated sometimes, right? So you have to configure all this, right? And then once you get all the config, you get the routes, you get the service working, you get auto sales auto-scaling strategy setups, and then you get to run it on top of Kubernetes or OpenShift. The thing is, is that the job of a DevOps or is it a job of devs, right? The devs thinks that I'm only responsible for my applications. Why do I need to like care about all that, right? And the devs, DevOps thinks that, how do I know how many configurations you need, right? So that's like a debate between each other and that's not cool, right? So this is what Knative comes to the play. Not only it does all the, you know, all the configurations for you, like it just does that. And and all you need to do is just write a couple of simple config. There's, there's no way you can get around that other than if you use camel K, that's another word I'll talk about later. But if you do that with camel K native, you, the, you can, the developer can, would only do a minimized work on the configurations and all this will be generated for them. So they don't have to do it. So, and not other than that, the Knative does all the revisions for them, and then it will just brings it up 
But the best thing about the K-Native is that the ability to provide the serverless capability, which is scaling to zero. So if you're not using, if you once you deploy your applications, once you've got everything configured, it's going to run. But if there's no traffic coming to call your applications, what K-Native would do is that once it sense there's no traffic, nothing's going on in my application, I will scale it down to zero. So basically it just terminates your applications. And then if something goes, if the traffic comes back again, then you're, it will automatically scale it up again. So that's how you can optimize your resource consumptions. But there's another problem, right? So who is going to trigger that? And how is that going to be triggered, right? I don't think a normal HTTP call would be just sufficient and enough because now you have uh, a smaller services, I think of a, a, that we call them a functions in the service world, where they're doing a very small snippet of things and uh, where they will wake up real quick. They're supposed to be small because you want them to spin up quick. So you can't really do like a huge amount of task in that, that, that piece of code, right? So you want to do that. And oh, once you get that, um, you want to make sure that there's a way to call these applications. And we don't want to do it in in a um, synchronized way because there's no time to wait for it. So that's why we want to introduce event-driven mechanism to actually trigger all this information. So that's why in Knative, it gives you a way to trigger your services or your, your functions, right? There's a way that you can trigger that all at the same time. Oh, by the way, the, if the events for floating in and out of these things are called cloud events. They're standardized so that you know you're, you're not creating a format by yourself so that it can so everybody would talk in the same language basically. Um, so you have a way to simultaneously bring up the services or the functions that you want. Or if you want to do some kind of orchestration, that's what integration do, right? We do orchestrate services. And you can do that with channel and all that kind of stuff. So this is what the Knative eventing helps you to do, right? A very simple demo that I want to show, and uh, right here is uh, I have a environment that's running already, right? I have two. I have two applications. They're all, as you can see, the the, the color is, is is white because it's not running, basically. And if I want to trigger that, I want to send events into a broker and those two gets notified right away. So what I can do is I can start, oops, I am in the wrong, OC create, So I am actually spinning up a um, a a service that is going to read information from external, and it is going to then broadcast into a broker that I have created. It said that in this versions of environment that it doesn't really like show you there's a broker in between, but in the later version, I it would have one that so you can see that uh, it's there. So as you can see that you know uh, once my uh, events gets into the services, it now starts up. And then once this starts up, it's going to broadcast to another another uh, place where it, then this one will get started up automatically. So you can see that everything starts up automatically before it was scaled to zero. And if I go and go ahead and then, and then do AOC delete camel source, source. Once I delete it and it's gone, it's gone. And then if you wait for a couple of minutes and this is going, the, the pod will then scale down to zero and it's not gonna take more, much more space. So that's like real cool in, in terms of, you know, getting a lot of that. And I also have another demo, but I don't think I have time to show you this time, but this one is showing you how to use that uh, with, uh, with channel. This, the one I showed you before was using broker, and this one's channel. One is more on the orchestration side, the other one is more on the broadcasting side. Um, so that's kind of uh, the two things that, you know, the, the two different things, but 
I also want to talk a little, a little bit about uh, what Kafka or AMQ Streams is doing here. So why do we need like streams, right? So what is Kafka? A lot of people doesn't know. For people that doesn't know, think about it as a super fast event store. Basically, it just stores a bunch of events. The reason why it gets really popular is because the high throughput. So because everything's talking binary, so everything's super quick. And like, honestly, Kafka or AMQ Streams is pretty dumb. It doesn't process the, the, the messaging for you. So by that means that the that's consuming all this information needs to be more smart, but that's another word. We'll talk about it in the architecture side, but yeah. So basically it has a higher throughputs and really fast replications than the, the way that they, they uh, replicate all is the, all this uh, messages to another broker, another place. It makes it super fast and everything is re reliably stored in a place. So you will be able to go back and see what's going on uh, before. And then it's really high, it's easy to scale. So that's why Kafka becomes super, super popular. And why, why, why is that? What, why do I need to talk about Kafka? Well, the reason why is because think about all the channel and broker, what do they receive? They receive cloud events. So where do I store all these events? Do I just keep them in memory and then they get wiped out after I restart the cluster? Of course not, right? So you need a place to store them. So that's where you, you want to have your Broker storing information into your your uh, Kafka event store, and then maybe later on in a day, if you want to go back and then analyze that, you know, doing you know a lot of people doing AI stuff, right? So if you want to go ahead and analyze, you know, uh, maybe behavior of your customers, um, there's a bunch of this is where you can store them. So this is the way you can actually like uh, so. Uh, basically, it was in uh, most of the brokers and channels when you start them up. They, by default, they're in memory, but there's this is the way that where you can configure. Of course, it's YAML. Of course, YAML, YAML all the way, right? So everything is in YAML. You can define where you where your uh, your Kafka store is, and then it's going to send everything into. It's going to store all the events that is passing through everything into um, into the Kafka store. Okay, awesome, Cam. Okay, so. I don't want to bore you with all the details of Camel K because I think you must have heard like this for a million times already in this conference. So basically what I think Camel K is, it brings developer joy back. So as a developer, as a serverless developer, all I want to do is write my code and it works, right? So this is, I'm not going to tell you how to write Camel codes because I'm assuming that everybody knows how to write Camel codes now. So, but I want to take a look at this particular components here. Uh, this particular components allows the camel route to talk directly to the channels and the broker that is provided by the events. So there's no other configurations. There's no, there's nothing you need to do. So it just talk, talks to it directly. And once you've done the coding, what you need to do is just uh, use the COI tools and then run camel run and it will just run. And it's running on your Kafka or OpenShift environment already. So one, two, three, three steps for developer. This is what, a, um, this is even way better because if you think about if you're doing a Java application, what do I need to do? Well, I, first of all, I need to write my code and then do a Maven build and then maybe do a Maven package. And then I, I can start, you know, doing a Docker image um, package, uh, package in a Docker or do an SUI depending on your, your method and then put it on top of OpenShift, right? So. This eliminates a lot of things. You don't. You no longer have to take care of a lot of dependencies that comes the default by Camel. It just finds that for you. So no more dependency hell, which is awesome. And then you you don't have to do a lot of um, configurations. But so where's this magic come from, right? Uh, well, this magic com comes from the operator patterns. Again, there's a Camel operator that's doing all the magics, right? So the, the, the code gets turned into a custom resource. Remember custom resource? Uh, it turns that custom resource and then turn it into a running pod on top of the Kubernetes environment. Then there you go, you have a running application. And it, because Camel operator is so smart, it knows that you have Knative running or the serverless capability running in your environment. So it will automatically turns your pod into a serverless pod. So it will scale down to zero automatically and then scale up if you want to do that. Right, how many times do I have, right? Okay, so here is, should I do the demos? Probably not. Um, I'll show you that I have, so for people that wants to see the demos I wanna do, there's a bunch of videos I have. Um, 
on the YouTube channel, you can go ahead and, and go through it. But these are the things that you know I really want to talk about the, pers the personas for doing service integration, right? So this is, these are the people that's using different technologies. So you've got the operations that's doing the OpenShift and Kubernetes setups. So they want to make sure that everything's secure. Um, they're running it on different clouds. I don't know if you use ever use Azure and use Google Cloud or use Amazon. They're all different. The way they charge, the way they you manage them is different. So you want to have something on top to um, to make sure that they're all working. And then you want to also make sure. And then as a DevOps person, you don't want to like touch the basic stuff. You want to make sure that you have the application that's running. You want to orchestrate, make sure that your container is all up and running. You want to create your CI CD pipelines for deploying and the de deployment strategies. So there you go, you have it. Um, so for the developers, you've got the brownfield developers that's doing all the jobs, and the, the greenfield developers that's doing the cool stuff, right? But you know what? They're do, all doing the same thing, right? So with the serverless stuff, what you can do is you can start um, by doing this anti-corruption layers where you are hiding the complexity of, of the older or legacy applications and then trying to transform them into a newer way of doing things and slowly convert them into uh, into whatever that you prefer them to be. So you can slowly transform them, strangle them, you know, the strangular patterns, try to do that. Uh, and then there, and then for the green field, all you need to do is just make sure that you're doing the event-driven um, calls and then you're trying to, and then if you're doing any composition of the functions, make sure that you're doing that with, so you can do that with Camel and it does that for you to orchestrate your events, to orchestrate your calls, you know, all that kind of stuff, you can do that. So these are the different personas, you're using different stuff to achieve different things. All right, and then here are some of the use cases. I see people were using serverless and Camel. These are the things I see. Um, in the financial world, I see people trying to provide a better custom customer experiences, they, they call it omni-channels. They have a bunch of tra traditional services that's running. It's been there for a long time. So what people do is they create different functions because these this new customer services are provided, not a lot of people use them because you know most of the people are still doing the traditional way, but they're testing the water. They wanna show, make sure that you know this all works. So they will create different functions or the serverless stuff that's talking to the traditional services, bringing that bridge, composing the service together to provide that omni, way that you know user doesn't have to go to different departments trying to get the stuff done and then we have the tra traditional like the trend the travel industry where when the customer checks in in the airline they want to make sure that um, a lot of um, their departments gets notified like your luggage department the uh, the check-in department and your points department gets notified right away so this is a great way to actually um especially with a lot of campaigns they do right now because of COVID and then a lot of like rescheduling, you want to make sure that the, the information gets there fast, but sometimes the information was not used all the time. And so you want to make sure. So this is a great way to do that is that you can have a single event source to send to a broker and broadcast it to different services. And then you also have the streaming processing. This is something that I see not many people use it, but I'm seeing that a lot of people are doing it is because the way that the uh, now the, IoT devices is now getting a lot more attractions. Now you're actually getting more user data. Uh, so this is where you can collect data using different functions or different services to analyze it and then send it to a data pool or send it to services or doing behavior uh, extractions and then you know things like that. And also you would and I see people use use uh, serverless as Chrome jobs, right? This is probably the most used case I see today is that they use that for Chrome job. It comes up. And then, I, and then it goes down and scales up automatically. That's a more traditional way of doing it. But I also see uh, managed file transfers. Um, not a lot currently in um, in the industry, but I saw some like labs that they're trying to do uh, because they're doing. They have a lot of images or test results they need to transfer it to some places. So they were thinking about how how do we uh, how do we use that? How do we utilize that? Because some of them does not need to analyze something. Some of them does. Can we make it into functions? So we're, it costs less for us to spin out those informations. And another one is um, healthcare because we're having a lot of um, healthcare standard. So how do I make sure that I'm sending the right format to the right system? So you need to have a lot of transformations in the service world. Uh, so this one is also doing integrations like you know transform data and then send it to different places and turn it into different formats. 
And we also have um, retailers, retailers where you're getting it from different resources. You have vendors getting different resources, and then you want to store them into your local environment. And then you also talk, and then the other one is talking to traditional, like, you know, SaaS applications where SaaS services are like Salesforce or ServiceNow. You want to integrate with what they provide. That's a lot of use case, right? Uh, so that's kind of, uh, hope I'm not out of time. Yeah. So that's kind of like uh, the things I see today. And this is just a quick architecture of how I see uh, it, like the so evolving to, right? So you would have an environment that's running all the containers, and then you will have AMQ streams that's, uh, that's like storing all the, uh, or Kafka that's storing all the events. But then you also have everything coming in from the source. That's that's listening from external service sources, and then it's gonna uh, it's gonna have to zero if it's not using it. So you have a bunch of source, and then these events gets passed into channels or broker depending on their natures, and then you you would have a bunch of functions, right? Microservices or functions that's um, try that's uh, subscribing to these events, and then they would immediately wake up if they see something happening when they're related to it. And then you would also, and then, then, then transform this data to a place in your in your enterprise would transform it to a sync, or you would have um, in, in internal, you have change, you have always have change data, you wanna capture them and then sending it into another broker so that you know the function here also picks up different changes in events, changes in data, and then they will react and or calculate on top of that and then maybe send it back to somewhere or invoke another services. And then you also have a place, uh, a place for registry where it tells you, what this particular event source or event uh, topics that's listening for what kind of data data format that does. So you would have that kind of things all over the place and everything will be event driven. And it will be a lot more flexible. And, and for a developer, you're not talking about, you know, you're not creating a bunch of, uh, you know, DevOps uh, configurations. You will be just install, uh, providing your code and everything will run just like that. And uh, so summary, Quick summary. So these are the four things that we talked about. You know, the base, uh, the store, the way to scale up, to go down, make it easy, and the way to integrate with the power of Camel, which integrates everything. And with Camel K, everything would be easy for developers because all they need to do is just to write the code, and everything would go up and running. So here is a bunch of resource I talked about today. I have a uh, a list of videos that you know that shows you how to do everything by scratch um, and then i also have hands on environment where you can go ahead and start playing with the technology with like the uh, the kubernetes installed and everything we can just play around with it and today all the demos i prepared all the repos are around here so uh, yeah thank you so do we have any questions awesome thank you for that whirlwind tour of uh, serverless integration christina I think this one can't be watched at a higher speed on YouTube. So it was truly really magnificent. Uh, so you kind of answered the, the question that Rodrigo had. Um, is the demo available on GitHub? You had a bunch of links there and you'll share the slides. So, you know, Rodrigo, you can get it uh, for from, from there. Um, and we have a couple of questions related from Hemang and Andre. Uh, around how do you manage multiple environments in such a world. So there's a question from Andre, how, to, how environment specific configuration will be applied. And there's a clarification from Hemang. Uh, so they have one cluster with different namespaces for dev test and acceptance, and then production cluster. Um, how do we configure, how do you manage, you know, where you're deploying, uh, how do you see the different versions there and things like that. All right, there's a lot of questions. So like the first question, managing multiple environments. Uh, well, I think you need to have a proper CI, CD pipelines and deployment strategies for that. Because um, if you think about it, you have a, and then, and I think also the serving of the revision will also help you with that. So basically what you do is once you write the code, you push it into environments, and then it automatically gets triggered um, by a pipeline and it gets to deploy in another environment. So basically, if you're doing serverless, you will actually see that happening in a in a cloud environment, but it doesn't get copied to the production environment um, because you need you need to make sure that it is running through the test. I haven't gone through the test environment, like the testing. 
scenario yet, but I think um, it's it's worth mentioning that everything should go through test. So once you write your debt, write your application, make sure everything goes right, then you go through the pipeline. The pipeline will have automatic testing and then you go through that. Um, and then uh, which one? The other thing is, I'm not going over time. Uh, we have minutes left. Okay, so the environment specific configuration, how do I, how do I apply? So in each environment, you can have a separate configurations in, in, each, in each, say, namespace, right? So in, in each namespace, you would have uh, the same name with different configurations. So when you move your application along, your configuration doesn't go with it. Or you, and then you can have that apply into, into different environments. That's how I see it. Um, Caroline, no, we don't have that. How, where do you configure the target cluster of names? Uh, I think it's just configuring that your YAML, YAML file, right? <laughs> Basically, you're, you can target uh, where you want to deploy your, your, your applications to, and then just method, in the matter of specifying to a different namespace. I'm not sure if I, I got the, 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 the full context of your questions, but from the looks of it, it looks like you're just trying to figure out um, how to, uh, how to, to deploy that into different namespace, I guess. Yeah, it's different namespaces or different clusters, but the same uh, right. environment, I think, that applies to your usual Kubernetes commands applies to the camel CLI, so, yeah. Right, exactly. So I wasn't sure, like, that's like a very easy answer. Just make sure you're configuring, it, you're pointing it to the right namespace. Or when you do, if you're doing Ansible, just make sure that your oh, yeah, YAML file is pointing to the right namespace. That's kind of... Uh, my suggestion to that. Awesome. So uh, the next track, uh, next uh, session will be starting. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Christina, and hope to see you all there. All right. Thank you.